Okay, so how many of you submitted PA2? Okay. Are you feeling proud of yourself to... <laughs> well, you should. Uh, what you've done is a better implementation of coroutines, or also called generators, than what Python has. When you study for the exam, you will see the semantic differences, and you'll see how the Python creators cheated to get them implemented. So what you have, as you will see, um, allows you to write much nicer, much easier to write generators and lazy iterators and all that stuff than what you have to do in Python. So uh, good for you. So what we are starting today is a essentially a milestone. Building on what you did with coroutines, we are going to go deeper into the territory of programming under an abstraction. And what I mean by that is we are going to build constructs that other programmers can more conveniently use. So rather than just being ordinary programmers, we'll give tools to programmers so that they are more productive. So what we've done so far is use these coroutines to build iterators, lazy lists. If you look at homework two already, then regexes and backtracking. So today, we'll go further and build on top of coroutines a prologue interpreter. So since you are doing so well, you can implement your own coroutines, we are not going to actually give you an interpreter for Prolog. We are going to guide you through most of the steps, but the actual implementation of the Prolog interpreter, you'll have to invent yourself. So this is a crucial lecture in that I'll try to teach you how to think about the problem so that then the last crucial step you can develop yourself. Uh, and needless to say, PA3 is assigned today, it's Tuesday. So we are starting again another deja vu. All right. So what we'll do today, think of it more as a discussion section. Uh, we'll have a bunch of problems to solve that will take us to the interpreter. And uh, get a paper and pencil and start getting ready for talking to your partner. Uh, so a prologue refresher. These are problems that Thibault, one of the TAs, invented a few years ago. These are a few facts that show what Thibault likes to eat. Also, who likes to eat Thibault? So if you ask the query, uh, would Thibault eat the lion? The answer is, the answer is false or fail or whatever your interpreter answers. If you ask eat Thibault X, what would the answers be? There would be two answers. One of them would be vegetables. You put a semicolon. The second one would be fruits. Then you do a semicolon, and then I think it will say fail or none or something, signifying there are no more answers. So, so far, so good. I could not answer an important but a simple question last time. I don't know where Rohin is, but maybe he'll show up in a second. So I'll try to answer it in a much more reduced, simple example. So. Look what I modified in this program, the refresher program. Can somebody describe to me the single change I've made? There's something in bold, but the bold, of course, is not significant for the interpreter. Something else is significant. What is significant? So is it a keyword, really? It is bold, so I see why you may be confused that it's a keyword, but it's not really a keyword. What is everything? It's a variable because it starts with a capital letter. So no, that doesn't have any special meaning. It's as good as x. I could have said x. Now, if I ask this query, what do you think the answers will be? The first answer should be simple, right? What would be the first answer? It would be vegetables. Now I ask with semicolon for the next answer. And what will be the answer now? OK. It would be an unbounded free variable. It would be essentially some internal version of everything. Let's just call it underscore everything. Because we will see today that the interpreter renames these variables for a good reason. Or you will see that in building the interpreter. But essentially, it binds x to this everything. And everything is not bound to anything. So this is the best answer it can give you. It's also sort of the most general answers, signifying that if you ask a query, eat Thibault foo, it will be a true query. Because according to the facts we have, Thibault eats everything, so he 
it's foo as well. The problem we saw last time was a little bit more complicated because we had these nested uh, facts like cons of something, but essentially the principle was the same. That yes, we can answer the query in the affirmative, but we have nothing more specific to bound to x, just another variable, so the answer is x can be bound to a variable. So that should answer that. Now, um, one thing we didn't get to last time are lists. So what, what is, uh, if you look at lists in Prolog, essentially Prolog gives you this notation for lists, okay? Gives you this for, this would be a head, this would be the tail. It's a special syntax. There is nothing magical going on underneath. They are using the sort of nested predicates to build lists, which are just essentially lists of elements nested within one another. And these are, this is how you can define car, cuder, and cons. If you are a scheme or Lisp programmer, and you're not familiar with the bracket notation, you want to use your car, could, or cons notation because that's familiar to you, this is how you would define it. So let's just look at car. If the first argument is a list, you would like the second argument to be bound to the head of the list. Okay. What happens here is that the list is decomposed into head and tail. And then this value here is bound to x. Cuder again decomposes the list, but by binds the second argument to the tail. And what is cons? Okay, cons takes a head and a tail, or x and the rest, and creates a new list where r is the tail and x is the head, essentially a prepending another cons element to it. So these definitions are nothing more than just finding another name, sort of aliases, cons, car, and cuder for existing lists. Okay, does that make sense? So I'll let you look at some of these definitions. Look at, say, car, and try to understand how that works. So remember when, let's, let's do this example. I pass A, B, C into car, and I ask about x, what would be the answer here? Okay, yes, x would be bound to a. If I ask about cuder of this list, x would be bound to b and c. Okay, so let's hope this is clear because we have a few examples with lists coming. So here is an operation on, on lists, okay? You want to ask whether an element is a member of a list. You clearly create a recursive definition now, just like you created the recursive procedures. The bracket notation is uh, sort of like a pair, except you could use in the bracket arbitrary number of things. So really what the bracket notation is, this here, A, B, and C, really is desugared in a familiar manner to a comma b comma c comma an empty list okay which really is the same as saying i have a b c and now i believe they use some special i'm not sure what comes here some maybe this is nil some special atom, some special name, okay? So the first desugaring still stays within the special syntax of brackets, but if you look at this, this is a pure prolog. Remember what is prolog? It just has predicates which can have arguments, and this is a special predicate with this funny name dot, right? We could call it foo. It would be the same. They just use the dot. So this is really the translation that you see that is going on under covers, and if you're familiar with syntactic sugar, you should understand that Prolog really doesn't understand anything about lists, right? The parser does, but the interpreter doesn't. So to get you familiar with lists, here is a definition of a member function. It's recursive, just like it would be in C or Scheme. 
And what does the first case say that, well, X is a member of a list if it is in the head, okay? Or X is a member of a list if it is a member of the rest of the list. How do you obtain the list? Well, you match on this, you extract the rest, and you do that. Also, because this is logic programming, you can think of it this way. You can say, well, if X is a member of the rest of the list, then it is a member of any list that contains anything in front of it in the head. So again, if X is a member of a list R, then it is a member of any list where Y is prepended to R. So you can think of it in whichever way, procedurally or declaratively, either way works. All right. So here is the list append, and now where things become a bit more fun, okay? So uh, here is a predicate that takes one list, another list, and appends them, concatenates them, okay? How do we do it? Well, the base case is simple. You say, well, if I take an empty list and another list, the result is what? The same list, right? Okay, so that part is easy. Now, how about the recursive case? Well, let's look at this. We take a list, decompose it into head and tail. We'll take x. What is the result? Right, the result will be a new tail. How do we obtain that? Well, the result is actually this. It's new tail with h prepended. Where does this h come from? comes from here, okay? Where does this tail come from? comes from here. Actually, I probably made it worse uh, with my line. So let's just look at that. Right. So one way to think of it is that you take a list to which you want to append eggs, you strip the head, and you recursively call it on the tail. You don't do anything with x. x is unchanged. Except when you get the result from here, you put it in here and you prepend h next to it or in front of it. So again, what does the recursive thing do? Strip the head, obtain the tail, recursively call tail with the same x, no change. You obtain the result, you pass it up here, prepend x, and this is the whole thing is the result of the computation. So the colon dash here means this is essentially, in, you can think of it in two ways. You can think of it as if this holds the right-hand side of the clause, so this is our right-hand side of a clause, and this would be, of course, the left-hand side. If the right-hand side holds, then you could say the left-hand side holds. So you can think of this as an implication. Another way to think of it is that if you are trying to answer a query, the query will match to the left-hand side, binding the variables. How is the query answered? Well, you go to the right-hand side and recursively answer the right-hand side. If you can answer the right-hand side, then you indeed have answered also the left-hand side. So you can think, but you can also think of it as a procedure call. You sort of call the left-hand side that translates to the call of the right-hand side. So look at that because append actually shows quite a few subtleties of, of prologue. It is one of the beautiful two-line predicates that do a lot of work, show quite a few principles. So what would be the answer to this call? What would be x? Well, we strip h, sorry, a, and then call tail with b, which then in another recursive call strips b and ends up with this base case where the first list is empty, x, or this is cd, that propagates back up a few times this way. First we prepend h, then we, sorry, b, then we prepend a, and then the result ends up being a, b, c, d. So one thing that I 
told you here is g I gave you this procedural view, which is if I pass here the list, like AB, it is decomposed into H and tail being this list. And then you call the right-hand side, okay? And I even showed you that X flows from here to here, and tail flows from here to here, and new tails fro flows from here to there. So some of them flow from left-hand side to right-hand side, the other, way, the other way around. But it doesn't need to be that way. What happens if I make this call? Mm -hmm. So indeed the answer is CD, but the important thing to remember is that what this rule says, it binds this and that new tail together, this X and this X together, and this tail and this tail together, but the flow could be this way, also that way. Similarly, it could be in either direction for all of these variables. And in the first query, the flow went one way, in the second query the flow went another way. So in a sense, what we have is a bidirectional programming because these variables can sometimes act as inputs into the entire operation, sometimes they act as output. So a single rule for append can compute x from these two arguments or it can compute x for these two arguments. So to make sure you understand it, uh, let's see. So what if we do this? Okay. This is clearly one answer. Are there multiple answers? If yes, how many answers would we have? Right, somebody said five. Indeed, these are the five answers we would get from append. And so a warm-up exercise for you is find a query that given the definition of append will create infinitely many answers. So, so far we had four answers, but we want now a query that if we enumerate the answers, the whole process will never terminate because there are infinitely many answers. So what would that query be? So I can go back to the definition of a pen so that you see it here. So this is the time when you don't just think really hard, because thinking hard is really hard. Uh, but you talk to your neighbor and you try to convince her that, yes, this is the query, and this is why it has infinitely many answers. Okay, so uh, how many people have or 
or think they have an answer or have a guess of an answer. Okay. You know, I wasn't sure myself until I tried it in the interpreter. You have not tried it, so you can have low confidence. All right, so uh, should we try? What is your query? I see. Okay, so let's actually try it. Uh, let's actually try it. Now I just need to find this. Okay, I will. So I have this. Okay, so we'll do append. An empty list in X and Y, right? So it has only one answer, right? Is that what you meant? Because essentially what it says that if you append anything to an empty list, the answer must be that anything. So essentially it says that X and Y must be the same. So it has essentially, you are correct that this answer really represents many different answers because whatever I put for x will be a correct answer for y, right? So you are correct that I can instantiate these variables x and y in infinitely many ways and it is still correct. But this single answer from prolog represents all of them. So in a sense, I, you're correct, I didn't specify in my question precisely enough. What I want is I want a query that when I press semicolon, I still get new, new, new answers. But you are correct, too, in that this does indeed have infinitely many instantiations. But you see, it was sort of smart. It said, I can describe with one answer all possible and, uh, results, and they, I can describe them by saying x and y must be the same lists. All right. Okay, so this is one answer. Right. <laughs> and so what it does, it now creates lists of arbitrary of all possible length. It doesn't know what these variables are. Right? It could be anything, and the way to say I don't care what the elements of the list are, and I specify the don't care by inventing a fresh variable that is not bound to anything. Excellent, excellent. Uh, my answer was a bit different but it was uh, essentially the same. I just put variables everywhere. All right. Uh, so play with it. By all means, this is fun, especially look at some fun examples from tutorials, work at them. So I would love to, instead of teaching you how to do the interpreter, go through these examples, because some of them can do computing a derivative of a function by you describing the derivative rules for differentiation and the given an input expression, it will do the computation for you. It can then sort of solve a math problem, not through math algebra. It can do two, but it can do it by just plain search. Like plugging in plus and minus between numbers is a problem I solved this morning with my son. It could do it by brute force search rather than by reasoning. And brute force search is elegant when somebody else does it for you and does it fast, fast enough. All right, so let's move on, please. He's eight. Uh, the interpreter is faster. Uh. <laughs> so let's go to the business of building the interpreter. So what happened during the execution? Uh, we were talking about matching, matching a query to rules and so on. Uh, that process is called unification. As some of you pointed out, it was covered in 61A. Well, this class is essentially just 61A on steroids, except we cover 61A in four weeks and then uh, all hell breaks loose. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so unification takes two terms and try to see whether they are compatible, so to speak. Okay. So, are these two terms compatible? Yes. No. Oh. Okay. So. Uh, if, if the one on the left, if this was a fact, okay, 
if this was a fact, and the second one was a query, what would be the answer to this query? The answer would be x equal 1, so it would be true. It would be x equal 1. And it would be a correct answer, because given the query, you can find a matching compatible rule. Okay. Why are they compatible? Because there exists an instantiation of these variables x and y, which makes them into identical terms. What is that instantiation? Well, what does y need to be? What does x need to be? Right? y will be 2 and x will be 1. If I do this substitution, I'll end up with two identical terms, so they are compatible. Okay? How about these two? Are they compatible? No, they are not, because there is nothing I can do with this a and b. They are not equal. Uh, so this one is no. This one is yes, and here is the substitution. How about this one here? It's no because 1 is different than 2. This no because A is less uh, different than B. How about this one? Yes, and the substitution is you'll make x equal to y. All right. So imagine we have a call to a unify function. We'll give it two terms. It will do its work and say not compatible, not unifiable. If they are unifiable, it will return the most general unifier, which is the substitution. It's most general in the sense that, well, it could return a particular substitution that will make them equal, but we want the most general thing. For example, a unifier here could be x equals y equals 1, but this one here is more general. Right? Because it has more possible substitutions that you can plug into them. These x and y are unbound. They are not specific. All right? Okay, so make sure you understand it. Discover whether these two pairs are compatible and produce the MGU if they are compatible. So again, work together. Uh, unification is sort of a boring part of the whole thing, but we need to understand it so that we can then go to the actual crunching that uh, the interpreter does. So again, work with your partners, work, work it out, they'll sample who has the right answer. There is a lot to talk about about these two problems. So if you are not talking about anything, it's, uh, you should be. All right, so let's start with the first one. Are these two terms unifiable? Yes, all right. Can we get the, 
the MGU. So X would be equal to B, B of C of underscore Z. Who agrees with that? Another attempt for, yes, please. You are agreeing, OK. Uh, oh, OK, I see, I see, I see. OK, I actually missed it myself. Any other substitutions that we need to make? How about Y? Okay, this would be C of underscore Z, right? Okay, okay, I missed something here. So one way to, you can see what's going on is to draw it this way. This is the left term. The right term is A, B, of y and c of z, okay? And we sort of start matching them top by top, and we get a match between a's, so that's fine. Now, this x must be unified to this, right? And y needs to be unified with that, okay? And this clearly is unified as well because it is the same variable. Now, it is a correct answer. Is this the only way how to write this MGU? There are clearly other ways how we could write the same unification, right? The same constraints. Uh, Well, how about if we say x is equal or maps to uh, b of y, y maps to c of z, would that be the same? So here is one MGU, here is another one. Are these two essentially the same? Syntactically, they are not the same. Clearly, these are different terms. But do they encode the same constraints? Right, so they are the same and exactly for the reason is that no matter what substitution you put into these variables, sort of ground these variables, if you say x is 1 and y is b and z is something else, whatever satisfies one satisfies the other and exactly the definition for why they are equal. So there are multiple MGUs, but they are really unique in the set of uh, constraints they encode, in the set of, set of substitutions that they permit. Okay, great, so this is fine. Now, how about the second problem, the little problem here? Are they unifiable or not? And now here is an opportunity to be religious about this uh, because there is no true answer, so we could really divide into camps and keep the rest of the lecture arguing. Uh, so, what's, what do you think is the right answer? So, if x is bound to an empty list, okay. Well, let's, let's try it out, okay. So, if I put here an empty list, I'll get here this on the left. This one here is a, and so they are not different. So x is not an empty list. That re really produces different results on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Okay, so, uh, so who thinks they are unifiable? All right, so it's, it's said you are correct. What can I say? <laughs> who thinks they are not unifiable? You're also correct. So if you think they are unifiable, then clearly we need an MGU from you. Okay, so what is that? X would be a stream of, oh, nice, okay, so <laughs> X is a 
is a stream of infinite ones, okay? So, uh, okay, that's a legal answer. So who thinks that they are not unifiable? Now, it may be harder for you to disagree since it seems like we do have a counterexample. Uh, Okay, so the, the response, by the way, we didn't hear it, that in the context of a language, can we encode uh, such a stream of infinite ones and really to produce equality? Uh, think about that while we hear another point. Okay, so you could encode it with essentially an infinite uh, predicate that generates that. Now, yes, we could. But the thing is that they designed or decided to encode unification in the context of, of prologue such that you need to find a finite substitution for it. And now we need an infinite one to really show that the terms are unifiable. So there does not exist a finite substitution that makes them equal, and therefore we will consider them not to be unifiable. But in another language, yes, you could, except in this one, it is not. So, so I think the answer here is not in prologue because the MGU, or this, I should say the substitution, must be finite. Okay, that's great. I, I love that. So. If you want to read an algorithm on, uh, for doing unification, a great write-up is in the book from which you will have a required reading. In fact, this chapter is part of the required reading, so why am I advertising it? Uh, and it's a simple description of how you walk top-down through the tree, push the goals on the stack that you still need to unify, and there is a nice example. We don't need it quite for the rest of the lecture, so I'll go directly to how I will try to teach you to implement the prologue interpreter. We are not going to just look at one interpreter and I leave a few things for you. We are going to walk through a few interpreters and we'll do it by building an interpreter for a subset of prologue, in fact, different subsets of prologue, and by sort of going to stronger and stronger languages, we'll learn how to handle this aspect and another aspect, and hopefully at the end you will know how to do it for the full prologue. So we'll organize these languages in, two, in, in a matrix, and we'll divide them based on how many rules they have on the right-hand side. So this matrix has uh, just one. This one can have an arbitrary number, okay? And here is what we'll do about the choice, what the choice I have in mind you see soon, but let me just say that in these two, no choice will be needed. Here the choice will be made by an oracle, so we'll rely on somebody doing this for us. And here we'll actually implement the oracle with backtracking. So we'll have six matrices. We'll walk through them like this, so cover five of them today. And of course the hardest one is your programming assignment. Uh, but you'll be ready to do it. So here is what the languages are. So look at them and you will see what I mean by having to make a choice versus not having to make a choice. And what I mean by the number of rules on the right hand side. Right? So if you look here, there is only one rule on the right-hand side of, one goal on the right-hand side of these clauses, whereas here we have one, two, one, two. So the interpreters here are going to handle programs with multiple rules on the right-hand side. Here, only one, okay? Now if you look at those, here we have a choice between C2 and C1. So there are multiple Cs here. Same for here. Whereas here, every predicate has only one choice on the left-hand side, right? There is one A, one B, one C. And that means the interpreter doesn't need to 
make a choice between them. It just finds one. It seems like that cannot possibly make any difference, but it does. And in fact, this is where most of the complexity in your implementation will come from, being able to handle the fact that there are multiple choices. Can you guess why this will be tricky? Well, it go, grows exponentially with the number of uh, clauses, but uh, the cost will not trouble you as much as the fact that you have to implement it. Uh, I think, yes, it will be exponential. This indeed is the complexity of Prolog, but the fact that you need to iterate over all these choices and consider one, and if it fails, then consider another one. You need to build backtracking to do this, essentially return and consider the next choice. This is where the complexity comes from. Okay? And which is why I want to walk you through the simple cases first so that you understand things aspect by aspect. Okay? Now, the orange algorithms are going to be deterministic, which is to say the algorithm does all the work. The algorithm prescribes what happens next. Those in the middle will get the help from the oracle. The oracle will just make the right choice of the rule for you. And this is still an interesting algorithm. We cannot run it without somehow implementing the oracle, of course, but it it will be nice to look at the algorithm and say, oh, if somebody made the right choice here, I know what the algorithm would have to do. Okay. So let's, let's start here. And what we want to handle are programs where on the right-hand side we have simple rule, one goal, and we do not have choices. So there is only one C, one B, one A. All right? So... What I want to teach you first is what's a proof tree. Essentially, this is just a trace of the execution. So if we have this program, which you just saw, if I ask this query, what would be the answer? Okay. Z equals 1. Of course, you know that. But now try to think how that answer was produced. I'll have on the right-hand side of the slide soon essentially a trace, a visualization of what the interpreter had to do. It was the same as you had to do in your head. So that's a good thing. But try to visualize it. So what, what happened during the answer of, of the query? So try to run it in your head. Well, uh, if you can concisely say what happened, this would be great. So please, go ahead. Um, is it basically that A of X is true if B of X is true? And then say that uh, B of X is true if B of X is true? And then uh, C is 1, and then say the index plus 2 is what you need to be 1. OK. So effectively, we go from, we'll, we'll say, well, C of 1 we know is true, hence C of y is true for what y? For y equal to 1. Okay? From that it follows that B of y is true for what y? Y equal to 1. And from that, right, we have proven that this holds. Now we are following this. Then this holds. And then that holds, right? So we have these implications. This holds A of x for x equals uh, y, and uh, hence a z holds for z equal to 1, right? Essentially, this is the derivation we made. How did we make the derivation? We couldn't, we, the interpreter, just look at the code and say, oh, here is the chain of implications, right? We had to find the right chain of implications. How did we find it? We'll build some graph and we search the graph. The graph doesn't need to ex explicitly exist, but we could think of it as existing, right? And here is indeed uh, the proof tree. So the proof tree was essentially constructed by 
recursive invocation of some actions. And I can tell you that the execution went like this. During the execution, we have constructed that. And then as we went up, we constructed something else. And you may be surprised why it's a tree. This one is not tree in particular, it's a chain. The reason is that on the right-hand side of every rule, we have only one goal. If there are multiple goals on the right-hand side, this is when the tree would become a true tree with multiple branches. But what I want you to do is look at that visualization of the tree of the proof process, which is really the execution of the interpreter, and try to understand what happened during the execution. I can tell you there are two kinds of steps that took place. Okay. Can you find where these two steps, one and the other, were applied? And what do they achieve? Right? So what I have here is going down the tree. There are two kinds of operations we took. Can you spot where they were taken? Okay. I want people to think about that. Because once you understand that, you have an algorithm for the simple version of the problem then we'll make it more powerful. Because getting this algorithm right is, is an important starting point. Uh, okay. So we want these two operations as we go down. All right. Uh-huh. Okay, so let's stick with that. I'll hold the thought about the other. So the first one, indeed, is what you described. The process of matching variables inside is really nothing different than unification, right? So the answer is we always have a goal. The initial goal is what? What would be our first goal? What goal do we start with? Is it like the first predicate in the program? What do you think we'll set our initial goal to be? I'm sure people know. How many people know what's the initial goal? Okay. The query would be the initial goal. This is what we want to answer. Is this true? Okay. So we'll start with that goal, and we now match it against something exactly as you described, exactly using the unification algorithm. The query is what? A name of a function, some arguments inside. We'll match it against what? We'll match it against these heads of clauses in our database of facts, right? So we start with this query, okay? And we'll match it against what? We'll match it against this. Do they unify? Yes, they do. Right? We obtain this information here. We have now unified x and z. And we have changed our goal from this to that. Now, a of z is true if a of x is true. We have essentially reduced our goal from the initial goal, the, or whatever the current goal is, to the one we matched it to. So we reduce this goal here to that one through the process of unification, because they are the same thing, they are unifiable. And this is the MGU of that unification that happened in here, right? So far, so good? OK. So what you described is exactly one of the steps. We take the current goal and match it against the stuff on the left-hand side, the heads of clauses. There are other places where this happens. It happens also here. And here, right? So these are, I'll do a legend. This is match current goal against oops, heads. OK? So we are done with half of the steps. What are the other half? Do you, can you say what the other operations would be? Yeah, the matching happens, but 
The remaining steps that we have not understood, such as going from A of X to B of X, what happens there? So what happens in going this way and going this way? What happens here? What are those steps? Okay. Exactly. We'll essentially replace the left-hand side with the right-hand side. Say, if I can prove the right-hand side, or if this is true, then the left-hand side is true. All right? So this here, what I visualize that way is, you could say, goal reduction. Okay. So now we have these two operations, and we go down, and as, as we do these steps, we compute these MGUs right, for each of these steps, okay. These MGUs are created as we match goals against heads. And then we go up, we'll merge these MGUs. And eventually we get the final one, and this is a projection to the result. Project the result, right? Because we don't really want to show the programmer all the intermediate variables like x and y, but she only wants to see the z. So this handles only the simple case of one choice on the left, one goal on the right-hand side. But you will see how the other algorithms are just generalization of this a little bit. So what I want you to do now is essentially write down the algorithm, because I really want you to understand the other generalization. So let's go on. We talked about that. Here are the two traces of running it, but I think you understand that. So I'll leave it just for the slide. So now take a paper and pencil and write the algorithm. I'll just flash it for you. It's really short. So it is maybe five lines. To make it simple, I'll want to, I want you to do the same cheat as I did. First, write the algorithm such that you completely ignore the business of MGUs, the fact that you need to merge them on the way up. It's easier that way, and then add the handling of MGUs. So take a few minutes. It's a good investment. Yeah, really do write it down. I would like to get a volunteer to write it on the board. Uh, it will be nice if there are some mistakes, because from those you really gain the understanding. Uh, if there are no mistakes, it's OK, because I'm sure my code has mistakes in it. So you can learn from those.
Okay, so who may be ready to write an outline here on the board or directly on my laptop? Who feels comfortable enough? Remember, it's uh, you get five bucks for free, so you yeah you can't fail. <laughs> uh, you guys feel like writing it up? One of you, maybe both of you, American Eagle. Yeah. So, who feels like they know how to do it? Okay, let's get it. Come here. Uh huh. Do you have pseudocode on the paper? Come here, I'll write it down if you don't feel like it. Sure. This is recorded, but there is no camera, so <laughs> you won't quite get famous enough. All right. So we are doing for each B on the left-hand side. OK, so let's write it down here. For each uh, B on left-hand side. So for you, well, how, about, how about if we say this? For each head H of a clause, Right, so we are walking through the clauses and picking up every head, all right? So the thing on the left, so let's call it the head. If unify A and B, and then, right, so we'll do if, okay, right, so we'll do something like uh, process uh, A, which is, let's say the type of this is our goal. If unify A with H, then we do what? We succeed. Uh, so we'll unify somehow. Like if, if the unification works, then uh -huh. we'll, we'll say A to the head. So head becomes our new goal. Yeah. OK? So essentially, this is our, let's, let's write it this way. New goal is H. Yeah. OK? And we break out of the for loop. And then now we, we match with the right hand side. Like we, we set, yeah. Like. Uh -huh, so now you want to take the right hand side and do something with it, right? Yeah. So, like we, we replace a with so we started with A, we matched it with head. And now actually the next goal would be the right hand side, exactly. all right? So we could say, well, we have one new goal, and then the next goal actually will be. You say the clause C, the right-hand side of that clause. There is only one goal. That's guaranteed by the restriction we have so far. OK? We recurse. Perfect. So we'll do, we'll do process new goal, all right? And if it doesn't unify, else we'll do something like return fail, OK? And we also need a base case, which is when. Mm -hmm. So we need to do something like, if no right-hand side, then we'll do return uh, something like OK. Thank you. So uh, is this reasoning fine? Do you see a problem with that? So we start with the goal A. We match it against the left-hand side. If we do find a match, now we need to decide. Does it have right-hand side? If yes, that is our new goal. Happened here, and we recurse. If there is no right-hand side, then we have reached a fact rather than a rule. And the fact is true. We can return OK. If we didn't match, then we have failed. And that fail will hopefully propagate up. Maybe we need to tweak it a little bit. All right. So do we see some problems with that? Uh, well, technically speaking, it doesn't have to be. Because remember, the restrictions we have now is we can match with only one head. Oh, I see. I see. OK, that's true. This needs to be outside four. So the for loop is between here and here. OK. Excellent. Yes. So when we go over all heads, 
uh, and we did not match, we fail, all right? This recursion here should probably say recursively call process and whatever it returns, you return, okay? I think we are pretty good. So here is how my code looks like. We start with a goal. We match it against a head of H of a clause C. See, I do not have a loop here because I'm assuming here that there is only one instance of each predicate. I don't need to go through them and see which of the matches. It's the one that I can directly find. Remember the restriction? I don't need to make any choices. If my goal is A of something, I'll look for that one A and I'll match it. So I don't need to have any loop here. Okay? That is my simplification. There will be one match, exactly one match. Now, if no matching had found them, return false. If I did find a match, but there is no right-hand side, I have found a fact. And otherwise, I recurse. I should probably say return here. So is that correct? Right, so this one is incomplete in the sense that it has no MGUs. Okay, now let's go to the next slide. And uh, here I have an MGU. So when I match my goal, say A of X with the head H, which might be A of Y, then I get the MGU, which is X equals to Y. Right, that's my MGU. The rest is the same, except I return nil for fail and MGU for success. And when I call it recursively, I get the MGU back, and what I return is a merge of these MGUs. There might be a mistake here, but uh, I think it captures it all. Right? So very simple extension. Right. So what has happened here? It's a simple recursion, right? We just have a goal. We know we match it against exactly one. The match produces an MGU. Then we go to the right-hand side. That's our new goal. And we recurse, recurse until we reach a fact. If we reach a fact, we are done. And we just collect these MGUs on the way back. Those propagate whatever constants we have in the base fact all the way to the answer. And that's it. And this is indeed the algorithm that I believe we gave you in PA3. At least that was the plan. This is what runs, and you can now start with that. The resulting algorithm will look very different, so don't think that you can just add a statement here and there, but this one runs. Does this work for a that have Does this work for clauses that don't have facts? Yes, so clauses that don't have facts are rules, right? They have left-hand side and right-hand side. It, uh, it does. In fact, here is one. If if you have no right-hand side, then you have found a fact, right? You could say you could found a fact. If it has right-hand side, then the right-hand side here is the new goal. So it does work. Uh, here is the base case that returns an MGU. Oh, I see you asking whether it works for cases that don't have uh, Facts, I see. No, in that, it, yes, that would recurse forever. You need to have a predicate that ends with a, with a fact. Sorry, I misunderstood. Yes, a fact can have variables, indeed. Exactly. So this will work correctly with the case when uh, the answer is, for example, the variable from your query unified with some fresh variable from the interpreter. Okay? One thing that this algorithm doesn't do, which is important, each time you encounter a new rule, which is here, and you make it your new sub-goal, you need to rename the variables. Can you guess why you need to rename these variables each time you encounter a new rule? What would happen if you don't? If 
you get collisions because these rules could be recursive, right? And these MGUs which you want to collect on the way up would have multiple copies of the same variables. And uh, they would essentially collapse facts that should not be collapsed, OK? So that we are not showing, but it's important to do that. OK, so let's look at this new language. This is still not a general prologue. It can have multiple rules on the right-hand side, but we cannot have multiple facts, multiple choices, or multiple rules. So uh, what extensions are we going to make? I want to introduce two facts, two sort of two new concepts. One of them is a resolvent. What is a resolvent? In the previous square on the left, we had always just one current goal. Now we are going to have multiple goals, right? Because when we match against the head and we go to the right-hand side, there are multiple, two, one, two, or more goals. This will now become all goals that we need to solve. So now there isn't a notion of one current goal. There is a notion of multiple pending goals that need to be answered. That's called a resolvent. And they form a stack, these goals on the resolvent. And you can think of it as a conceptual stack that you don't really need to implement. Maybe you'll find it convenient to build it with an explicit stack. But at least think of it as a stack, because what happens? You pop a goal from a stack. You find a matching clause for a goal exactly as we already know how to do. If the popped goal is answered, we go back to step one. If not, you push the goals from the right-hand side of the stack, and you go back to one. So the stack is nothing else, just keeping those pending goals. Okay? So this is a conceptual stack, could be real, could be different. Okay? So think of the resolvent as the set of pending goals. And so now I want you to write an algorithm for this language, which could have multiple goals. For your reference, here is what we developed for the case of no, for just one right-hand side. So you can look at that and think how you would extend it. Now we want these extensions to be minimal, ideally one line change, two line change. So think about this and how would you change it so that it handles the multiple right-hand sides. And don't feel forced to use a stack. The stack might be a conceptual thing that is handy to use in drawings, but you may not want to have it in the implementation. Okay. So how many people know the answer? Uh, OK, we need more. So think about. What has changed compared to the previous one? The only change is that now the right-hand side here, so this is the case that handles right-hand side. Now this right-hand side could have multiple goals, more than one goal. Before, it was always one. So the delta is that it can have more than one goal. So what would you change? How would you simulate this? The popping from the stack of the goal, resolving it. So we could potentially take the right-hand side, which is here, right? It's the R RHS is the list of goals on the right-hand side of that clause, and just push it into the stack and do what I have here. Pop a goal and repeat the algorithm from number one, push the goals to the top of the stack. Is there something simpler that we can do? Right? Uh, 
Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay, so you are in fact jumping one step ahead. You are saying, what do we do with MGUs from all these sub goals? Since now we have multiple sub goals on the right. And in fact, all of them need to be merged, right? But you need to merge them sort of progressively as you go through these goals. Excellent. But even before we get to the business of MGUs, how do we change this code? Please. Right. Essentially, whether you use list comprehension or not, you are saying we just need to iterate over these goals, doing exactly what we did before, but we do need some special handling for MGUs. So here is the only change, your algorithm we discussed, but here is the, well, look what I have here. I just say, for all goals, I should say c.rhs. Just recurse. So it's a one-line change. Okay, but now we need to do something with those. Now we need to do something with uh, the MGUs. And uh, clearly, we do need to do something with the MGUs on the way up. Do we need to do something with MGUs on the way down? And this potentially exposes a problem in the first algorithm we have. Right? So what we do in the first algorithm, we unify, create an MGU, we say things like x must equal to y. OK, that's good. And then we go down, we go down, we go down. And matching may happen quite nicely, successfully. But we are not propagating down the MGUs that we have built so far. So if up on the tree we have learned that x and y must be the same, we are currently not propagating it down. Could that be a problem? Also for the simpler case of one rule on the right-hand side, OK? I was, OK. So where did the propagation happen? So we are going back. We are going here, right? Oh, I see, I did. But I didn't use it here, OK? So what do we do with this MGU? Oh, OK. So exactly, <coughs> need to use it in Unify, right? So, so that people understand why this is important. When matching these two terms, you may discover that, say, x and y must be the same. And then when you do some other matching, the matching might succeed under the condition that x and y are unrelated. But if you additionally insist that x and y are the same, you could fail to find a match. Because you have now this additional constraint that can prevent you from matching things. Remember how we had the case where these two terms were not unifiable because we needed an infinitely many, infinitely large MGU. So there are cases where knowing more constraints would prevent unification. So we do need to pass this MGU down and use it in unify. I'll try to spell it out more nicely on the slide so that it is clear. And the same we need to do here. Right? So we iterate over all of these just like before. We need to pass the MGU down, OK? But that MGU needs to do what? It needs to collect all MGUs from the rules so far, right? Uh-huh. Indeed, for efficiency reasons, these MGUs are represented as tags that you add to them and then you pop from them when you need to backtrack. Okay. Uh -huh. And this is exactly what we are going to do. So we'll get this, let's call it RMGU, the result from here. Okay. Now we'll do MGU equals 
MGU, some sort of merge operator, RMGU. We merge them, and now we'll pass it in here into this call, right? And now it looks like we are happy. Oh, I see. You could, but let's not go there. I think that this could be one of the optimizations, but I don't want to confuse things here. All right. So we essentially have done the MGU. Now, what will change here? I want to actually really quickly go through these algorithms because they are now really simple. In order to handle now these two choices, what do we change? We could loop through all of them, but let me give you a very simplifying assumption, and that is all I care about is find one solution, right? Now, you don't know which of these matches leads to the solution, but an oracle would know. So imagine somebody knows which choice to make, and they give you the choice, all right? How do you change the algorithm? By the way, read about the search tree. It may simplify your understanding of what is going on. But let's look at here. This is the algorithm that we had before. Here you match goals against the head. You produce the MGU. And now you have the problem of, well, what if there are multiple matches? And you need to intelligently pick from among them. So here we simply say, Oracle, give me one, the one that is guaranteed to lead to an answer. That's the only change we need here, because if he gives us the right one, we are done. Okay? This one here is essentially the same. You're asking the Oracle, but you are keeping, you are looping over the rules on the right-hand side. And now, what happens here? If we don't have an Oracle, how do we implement the Oracle? If you understand that, you will be ready to do the final thing on the, in here. So we cannot ask an oracle. What do we do? It is exactly what you said. You iterate over them. Okay. But is the iteration as simple as we think? Okay. Is that sufficient? So essentially, you're saying the structure is you have a recursion. And at each of a recursion, you have multiple rules that you need to iterate through. You iterate all of them here, all of them here, all of them there. It's exponential because if you have 10 choices here, 10 here, 10 here, you have 10 to the depth of this chain. So indeed, this stuff here is very simple. You just have a recursion plus loop at each level of the recursion. So. Why is this harder? Why do we ask for the use of coroutines there? So the answer is not that you don't have to go through all of them. You still have to go through all of them. But if you all of a sudden have multiple rules on the right-hand side, the simple structure that you just described, which is have a recursion, and each level of the recursion has inside a loop, it doesn't work. So try to take the algorithm that we have here. You can trivially extend it in here. You just ask an oracle. Here we added a loop to iterate over the choices at each level of recursion. And now the loop that we have here that handles multiple cases and the loop that we have here conflict, and you will find yourself needing coroutines to still be able to recurse nicely over the alternatives. So you'll go through it again in the recitation tomorrow, and you'll understand better why things get harder going from here to here. Thank you.